Hello lovely people, welcome to another book chat, the regular roundup of stuff I've read at some point in my past. I've got four things to talk about this week, let's dive in. I'm going to kick things off with a book that has a stunning cover. This is Armistice by Lara Elena Donnelly. This is the sequel to Amberloo. It is the second book in this trilogy. I have been so enjoying this because I think the framing of this trilogy is really interesting. So um, the first book, Amberloo, was like billed to me as like Le Carre meets Cabaret, but also very queer. And it definitely hit all of those things. The first book is looking, it's centered around the city of Amberloo. And it's this fantasy, but it is very heavily inspired by Weimar era Germany. And it's essentially the first book is looking at how a fascist regime comes into power. We follow um, three perspectives, Cyril, who is a spy, Aristide, who is a smuggler, and Cordelia, who is a cabaret performer. Obviously, this is the second book, so I will um, not spoil anything that happens in the first book. But essentially, we this is set a couple of years after the events of the first book. And that's something that I find so interesting. I always feel like Lara Elena Donnelly in this is always focusing on things that are not necessarily um, the events. That, let me explain. So the first book I thought was going to be more like resistance to a regime, but the first book was very much like how does this regime even come into power? What needs to happen to enable that? And how does that happen? Then we've skipped the three years that we've skipped are the years that are like this uh underground resistance movements um resisting this regime and um you know like conducting uh retaliation against them and that kind of thing so where we are here our character who has been involved in that resistance has fled Ambalu. so this entire novel takes place in a different place um and someone else who fled at the end of the first book is in this and it's it's this is essentially looking at the outside the place that we're set in has a degree of autonomy that Amberloo doesn't so that's an interesting perspective in the first place and then the characters are engineering things so our resistance character is as this goes on they start in a place of having fled um they're there are discussions about what should the resistance look like? How do you negotiate with other factions to engineer situations that would be beneficial to your resistance? Um, all of these kind of like peripheral things that need to happen for the action to happen. But in some ways, it's kind of weird because you're not in the action, you're in the setup. And I just I think that's a really interesting like lens. Like it's not... Um, deep in the city like we're throwing bombs at the enemy it's very much like okay well you've had to flee how do you pick yourself back up if you meet viable connections how do you go about negotiating like tit for tat like all of these things like that's so interesting to me so I think that's one thing that I really enjoy about this is that it never it always defies my expectations of what the time period we're going to be in is um Character wise, I have characters in this that I'm very fond of. Cordelia is a real favourite of mine. I just think her character growth is so interesting. I think she manages to always be very like true to herself, but she has changed so much. Um, Aristide is a character who I am very fond of. We're sort of like haunted by like the presence of a figure who is not actively present, but it does is revealed to be at the edges so I'm, I'm hoping to get more answers for that in the third and final book for sure um so as a start point of being in a completely different um time place and main characters than I necessarily expected I've really enjoyed this I think it is a very interesting look at sort of these concepts whilst very much being like a fantasy series series that holds its own even if you like don't really know anything about like the world war ii history that it's kind of drawing on um yeah i could probably talk about this a lot more if i was going into spoilers <laughs> but i don't want to do that i would just say that if any of that sounds like your cup of tea i would recommend it i really enjoyed it i think it has a lot also of like moral murkiness like there are characters in this that other characters are very attached to or have like a lot of affection for who have done objectively very bad things and again like none of this is like straightforward there's 
murkiness with all these levels and I just think that that lends itself to like some really interesting examinations. My other fiction book I read on my Kindle and that is Radio Silence by Alice Oseman. I've meant to read Alice Oseman for ages because a lot of people on booktube really like them. <laughs> um, and, but this is my first one. Radio Silence follows Frances who is, um, she's a very conscientious, hard-working girl because she's sort of focused on studying and achieving all these uh, grades so that she can like achieve her goals and like the life that she imagines is the life for her. Um, she is a massive fan of this podcast called Radio Silence and she meets this boy called Alid and it becomes revealed to her that he is the one who runs the podcast. Um, they strike up like a friendship and then like shenanigans ensue. Um, I definitely understand why a lot of people love Alice Oseman. I found this book incredibly readable. I read this while moving because I was like... <laughs> with lots of moving parts and I was like I just need a book that I can just like read and I don't have to challenge myself that much and I just like insofar like in like narrative style and I like, just like know I'm gonna have a fun time reading and I definitely felt that they felt very like authentically teenage to me and like the age they were supposed to be essentially I think my main thing about this book is I think I would have loved this if I read it when I was closer to the age of the characters because I think there is um lots of themes in this about like um, not necessarily wanting to go off to university, but finding that a challenging thing to discuss, like not knowing what you want to do, being afraid of letting people down, that kind of thing. And I think if I'd read this when I was like closer to 17, I would have connected with a lot of this. Reading this as an adult, I do at times have the thing where I'm like, have you considered talking to someone about this? Like with, with things like not being sure if you want to go off to university, like you could not. <laughs> Like, but that's me as an adult being like, just use your words, have a conversation, see what you actually want to do with your life. I do understand that when you're actually a teenager and you're in the midst of it, like, and the pressures and that kind of thing, and I think that it is exploring, like, a lot of really good stuff to do with that. I think as well towards the end, it kind of got a little less, like, grounded for me, and we got, like, lots of things were happening, and I wasn't, I didn't always feel like they were, like, hugely realistic. I did feel like the friendships were really realistic, like the bonds these people had and the way they like bonded I thought were really great and I really liked that. So this is a book that like on the whole I thought it was a perfectly fun read. I think I'm not the target for it anymore and that's absolutely fine, but I definitely enjoyed it. I would read more Alice Oseman. I'm quite interested in Loveless. Um, if you have any other recommendations that you think I might like, do let me know. After that is some poetry. This is Eidolon by Sandeep Palmer. This is, uh, I was interested in this because it's exploring one of these ideas that's like one of my buzzwords. And that is this idea that like Helen of Troy never went to Troy and instead it was an Eidolon of her. So it's this idea in Greek mythology, like an Eidolon is like a shadow self. And so the concept is that Helen um, stayed in Egypt this like Eidolon version of her went to Troy um, and it kind of it's this way of like because um, in some cultures like Helen was a goddess in herself and it's this way of sort of um, rather than dealing with the messiness that occurs between like this person like is she the cause of this war and blah 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 it like immediately exonerates her because it's like well she wasn't even there it was just this shadow her and it's something that I think, um, I just think there are a lot of really interesting discussions around that. I like wrote essays on it at university. Like, do we need to have this as like a way of exonerating her? Like, what is there to exonerate? Like, all these kinds of things. Um, so this is a poetry collection that is like very much drawing upon that. I think these poems are engaging with that idea of Helen in a really interesting way in the way that is sort of like acknowledging that like Helen is as much a part of Troy as like the walls of Troy um, and that Helen um, is often a scapegoat, she is often silenced in these ancient texts and um, essentially there's so much nuance around the figure of Helen that is not always explored. She's often like dichotomized as like uh, the whore figure that like she's the cause of the whole Trojan War, all of these deaths are on her, absolutely no one had anything else to do with it, it was all Helen's fault, um, couldn't be the gods, couldn't be any of the people who went to war. Um, and then also this other side, which is that, okay, well we have to just remove her from these complexities entirely, and we have to make it as if she was never there, because that's the only way to exonerate her. And this is really looking at, like, the nuance there. It's also looking at a lot of other things, like nationhood and identity, or like when I say nationhood, kind of like citizenship, um, consumption, like 
modern American culture, like all sorts of stuff like this. I don't know. It's one that I think I need to read again because I read it all in one go because I liked to like I wanted to just like immerse myself in it and I found it really interesting. I think I'm gonna keep it and I think I'm gonna return to it again and do like another read through when I've like sat with it a bit more and see what else I can pick out on like a second read. I often find that with poetry that I need to like return again. So I thought I would sum it up having just read it the once as to like like my initial thoughts but um, definitely one I'm going to keep and definitely one I'm going to return to. Finally I just wanted to end on a non-fiction and this is Once Upon a Time in the East by Zhao Lugo. This is um, Zhao Lugo's uh, memoir about um, growing up in China. Um, when she was a baby her parents left her with her grandparents and so she was brought up by them in a very small fishing village and then at a certain point her parents came and claimed her her parents were involved in the communist party so she spent her childhood in like a much larger place then with um, a lot more presence of the communist party involved and then as time went on she came to um, the UK and she she has she's also a fiction writer and so she also sort of talked about like her challenges of like coming to the UK she came on this grant but then um, having to adjust to like not knowing the language and that kind of thing um, I picked this up because it was billed as this generation's wild swans and I really loved wild swans I enjoyed this I enjoyed learning more about Jean Lugo's life it was very interesting to get a younger perspective on some of these historical moments that I've read about through wild swans and life and death in Shanghai to get like a younger person's perspective on that because she was very much like a child I think one thing is that I didn't really connect to her style of writing so I found everything she was saying about her life really interesting and there were some really moving moments in this her relationship with her grandmother especially was really touching um, her process of learning English and struggling with English when she's learning Chinese like the symbol for a certain word is made up of smaller symbols that mean things and then there's a poet there's a poeticness to the combination of um, smaller meanings that make up a new larger meaning and she found that was something she really connected with and so then learning English like she completely lacked that and she really struggled with that also because she's also like a filmmaker she went to Beijing to um, study film and um, so she was, she has like an involvement in a lot more like art style that is more like performance art based and that kind of thing which again was interesting but I don't have a huge grounding in performance art and that kind of thing so it's not a particular like style of expression that I really connect with so I found it interesting to read about but I also like didn't necessarily like connect to it so it's one that I'm definitely glad to have read. I found it really interesting and I definitely think it's like added more to like to my understanding of China and like what it is like to be um, Chinese in different places and that kind of thing. It's not one that I would necessarily recommend above some of these other novels. That's it for this week. As per usual, I would love to hear your thoughts on any of these. If you have read them, please do leave me a comment down below. Um, otherwise, I hope you're having a lovely day. I will see you next time for something different.